Thanks for being here this afternoon. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is a little bit different from some of the other presentations. It's not all that technical, but I want to set the context for some very important and far-ranging changes in the way the Department of Defense is using computer networks, social networks, and also our communication systems. And I also want to lay out some areas where we really need your help in terms of not only improving our capabilities, but also the security. And my name is Lynn Wells. I work for a part of the Office of Secretary of Defense that looks at information technologies. And this office is also the Chief Information Officer for the department. So that's sort of the background. Uh, the context here, uh, the title uh, was Net-Centric Operations and also unclassified information sharing with non-traditional partners. And people talk a lot about how the Defense Department uh, shares classified information. This is unclassified, and the non-traditional partners refers to people like humanitarian assistance organizations, state and local first responders, um, local security services, and a mix of scenarios like disaster relief, uh, building capacity of foreign nations, uh, and stabilization operations after conflicts. So it's really quite a new mission for the department to get involved in. All this and the net-centric operations are based really on considerations of both national and international security. And we did a national defense strategy last year where the point is laid out here. The defining characteristic of the security environment is actually uncertainty. So how do we move from the predictable past of the Cold War and having a monolithic sort of enemy to fight into this era of surprise and uncertainty? As many of you know, the Defense Department has a very structured planning process. It's a long process. In fact, if you look at the acquisition of major systems, it can be 17 plus years that we're actually working on the budgeting and the planning for these things. It's worth keeping in mind that this is longer from, than from before the Wright brothers' first flight to the end of World War I. So what we're effectively asking people to do is estimate the need for military aviation before the first airplane is flown at the end of a war that nobody expects is coming. And you superimpose that the timelines of the industry that you're all involved in, the, uh, of not only information technology, but the sort of the five great revolutions of our time, of information, of biotechnology, of uh, nanotechnology, of robotics and, and energy, and InfoBio, Robo, Nano, Hydro, and you're just looking at an enormously dynamic security environment that's going to outpace almost all of our planning. So hence the point. Uncertainty is the critical future feature. The key then is to make the U.S. forces agile and robust to respond to this variety of situations even if you get surprised. And that's where this whole business of the network and net-centric becomes so critically important. We've got to move our focus from being in stovepipes, sort of Army, Navy, Air Force, don't talk to each other, to having enterprise-wide. We're not just talking about the warfighting applications, it's also business, how do we acquire things. Defense operations, intelligence, how do we share the intelligence that's gathered, uh, and then the, um, uh, then the various business processes. We're trying to move from a system base, and you want to buy a fighter plane, you want to buy a tank, you want to buy a ship, to capabilities based. And we want to be able to access, share, and collaborate the information. I'll come back to that repeatedly. I have to emphasize just how fundamental these changes are to the culture and the policies and the processes of the department. We have all grown up, who have been in defense for a long time, in an information where knowledge is power, and information of, sh of uh, the information belongs to its owner, and you treat information as something that you protect and, and, uh, and don't share, rather than something that you're a steward of that needs to be shared with those who, who have to know about it. And finally, the emphasis is moving away from a producer-based system, I produce the information, I own it, to a consumer-based focus where if we need to have it, we find a way to get it. Again, these are huge cultural changes. The place we're trying to get to is not just a technology change. It's people and processes and technology working together to make sure that you've got access to the information, the information is shared, and those who need it most can work together, can collaborate on it. The bottom line is connecting people to information. It's not just building fighter planes. It's not just building tanks. It's not just building ships. The information has become the core of what 
the Defense Department is all about. Next slide. So in conducting the net centric operations, you start at the top with a security context. This is what the international security environment is all about. You can see, maybe you can't see, they're hard to read, but it's uncertain, it's asymmetrical, you don't have a common, uh, you know, peer competitor, global, diverse, distributed. So the strategy is transform our own national security strategy to conduct these net centric operations and to create a collaborative information environment where you get the agility out of the system. Why is the agility important? If you think back in the early days of the war in Afghanistan, there was a special forces soldier on horseback, horseback of all things, that was getting close air support from 40 year old bombers that were dropping precision guided uh, weapons guided by the global positioning system all linked together by a data network. None of those were being used for the purpose they were designed. Every one of them was an innovation to provide the agility to meet the scenario that was in. That's what we're trying to get to is net centric operations gives the agility to meet these uncertain futures. There's something down at the bottom called the gig uh, in the lower box. That's called the global information grid. And this, again, is not just a network. It is the people, it is the processes, it is the technology that does anything that collects processes, stores, manages information in the department. This is a very heterogeneous network. We're talking about 10 gigabit per second stable fiber out to handheld soldier radios at the tactical edge. We have to find a way to find end-to-end -end uh, connection of all the people who need to know this. Next. So where we're trying to move from are a series of information stovepipes. Somebody described them as cylinders of excellence. To, uh, to shared information, trying to move from interfaces that are hardwired into the systems. I, my God, I built the uh, terminal for this satellite and that sucker's gonna be on orbit for 22 years and you're stuck with my terminal. To commodity-based unconstrained sharing. Uh, accommodate uncertainty. The goal is to make all information in the network so it's accessible, uh, sorry, discoverable, accessible, and understandable by unanticipated users. If you look at some of the coalitions we've been operating in lately, we have really long-term loyal partners like Tonga and Lithuania. You know, there is no way that anybody would have planned to share information with folks like that when the systems are being designed. We have to be able to accommodate them in the future. Uh, fixed display formats, people talk about a common operational picture. We want to get away from that. We want to move to user-defined operational pictures where you draw on the data to display the information that you need. I may need to know 10 kilometers around my foxhole. Somebody else may need to know the total air picture over the entire thousand mile space. The user defines what they're doing. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, need to know has been the mantra of all dealing with classified information. Do you have a need to know? If you do, then we'll share it. The model now is need to share. We cannot get the job done unless we share the information. You saw that in the 9-11 Commission. We've seen that in the operations that are going on today. It is a fundamental change in the culture of the organization. Next. So the result is that the network is really becoming the center of gravity, the core, the most important single integrator across the entire Department of Defense. The organizing principle is I, whether I'm a businessman, whether I'm a warfighter, whether I'm a general, whether I'm a private, can get the information that I need when, where, and how I need it. That's the essence of the net centering information environment. And the goal of this is not just to share information. The goal is to turn data to information, to knowledge, to decision, to action as quickly as possible. I mean, one of the points that you all have has come out in the sessions here today, we've got to be able to respond to threats in machine time on the networks. If you sit there in your network operations center and watch the links turn from green to yellow to red, you've missed the boat. And so how do we do this? So the result, again, is the network is the center of gravity. What we have to keep it from becoming is our Achilles heel. And we absolutely do not have all the answers. I mean, I've learned an awful lot just here in the presentations I've heard yesterday and today. We've had a number of people here listening. We need to go back and fold this in to the way we're doing business. When I talk to industry, the single most repetitive theme I have is we need more secure products from industry. We understand the pressures to market. We understand the needs to just get stuff out there. We cannot take 
the 2.9 million, million computers that are running in the Department of Defense and have them all be beta testers for uh, some new commercial product. Go ahead. So some of the things particularly that have been important, uh, IPv6, MANA, I mean all of this battlefield uh, networking is going to eventually be MANA networks and yet we are discussions that say they don't scale beyond a few tens of users. How are we going to put that together? The complexities of IPv6 are something we're very much wrestling with. The vice driver's piece we just heard was absolutely fascinating, uh, as have been the discussions of the complexity of 802.11, which I'll get into more later. Um, what I want to talk about now is this unclassified sharing, because traditionally when you talk about sharing information in the Department of Defense, people think about sharing secrets. This is something very different. There have been a whole different series of missions that have come to be important to the Department really over the past two years. Uh, one is, let me start from the bottom, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, beginning with tsunami in Southeast Asia, following up Katrina and Rita on the Gulf Coast, the Pakistani earthquakes, the mudslides in Central America, most recently the potential eruption of Mount Merapi in Indonesia. The U.S. military is deployed in humanitarian disaster relief work uh, just almost all the time. Post-war stabilization, security, transition, reconstruction. Uh, the Defense Science Board a couple of years ago criticized the department very severely for doing too much planning uh, for the conduct of the war itself and not enough preparations for the post-war stabilization reconstruction. This is being adjusted uh, dramatically right now in the emphasis within the department. And uh, as you can see, the military support to SSTR. Building partner capacity. The real goal of the department right now is to avoid the conflict in the first place. So how can you work with partner nations to make sure that uh, the conditions of instability, the uh, conditions of uh, you know, social crisis can be perhaps ameliorated, even avoided, to get away from having to fight in the first place. So these missions require that we share unclassed information outside the boundaries of traditional networks. Go ahead. Uh, this again is not theoretical. This is real world situations that are going on today. And so the non-traditional partners we talk about, non-governmental organizations, Doctors Without Borders, United Nations, uh, Red Cross, Indigenous Security Services, the, you know, the Afghan, the Iraqi, the, uh, the Nigerian, the uh, Peruvian, these are you know, people who will probably not get U.S. security clearances, probably not get inside our firewalls, but are absolutely crucial to the effective uh, completion of the mission. At home, state, local, tribal governments, First responders, whether they're, uh, again, in, in uh, overseas or domestic uh, situations. And very, very importantly, commercial partners. People come to realize that the partner in these operations is not just government. The private sector has an enormous role to play. The policy issues, education of our people and others are really much more important, more challenging than the technical solutions. Um, we sent some people from my office a couple of years ago down to Southeast Asia for the tsunami relief. And there was a Navy doctor, a civilian doctor, and a um, retired uh, Navy pilot. So in that operation, there was an aircraft carrier operating off the coast, and obviously there were lots of non-governmental people in Indonesia. And the two doctors could walk into the ULAN liaison office in Jakarta and get a Brasso. You know, hey man, we worked together in Kosovo. We were together in the Congo. They had the social relationships. The pilot could get back on board the aircraft carrier and get high five. Let's go to the ready room and talk pilot. When they got together a few days later, they found that the carrier was prohibited by doctrine and policy from sharing information outside the military domain with people who didn't ask. The NGOs didn't know they had to ask, didn't know how to ask. Within about three days, the time those fo within a couple hours, the time those folks got together, there was all kinds of information flowing. But we had to bridge the policy and the cultural gaps in order to cause it to happen. A very, very important statement was made about two months ago by one of our four-star generals who made the observation that the priority of sharing unclassified information needs to be comparable to the priority of sharing classified. Again, this is a huge change. 
And finally, we've got to address not just people who are always up on the network. We have to address the disconnected user. Because lots of times folks in these austere environments of information uh, sharing and disaster relief just aren't going to have the 24-7 uh, connectivity. So what are some of the requirements for this sharing? First of all, uh, the policymakers and the planners have to treat the requirements to share as a strategic requirement. This can't be treated as a techie adjunct to major muscle movements of delivering food, water, and shelter. It's got to be a core th function of what we're doing. Second of all, we've got to engage with these non-traditional partners outside the boundaries of the military networks to things like communicate, collaborate, in some cases translate, and find ways to engage effectively in these environments. And often these are very austere environments. There's no power grid. There may be no social services. Uh, there may be uh, governance have been uh, disrupted. We need to have common interoperable tools to share. And geospatial information tools are very, very important in doing this. Information assurance and credentialing is absolutely crucial. I'll come back to this again and again. Uh, distributed trust is what we need to be able to establish in these environments. How do we know when you're trying to bring back up Hancock County in Mississippi that you're really talking to uh, you know, the mayor or the police or the firemen, not somebody who's trying to run a scam? Uh, in the case of Indonesia, there was an uh, insurgency going on in Banda Aceh province, or in Aceh province. Uh, so the Indonesian folks said, well, we, we want to be a little careful about who you share the information with so we don't inadvertently wind up uh, stoking or, or giving advantage to the insurgents. This local knowledge uh, is absolutely crucial, but we've got to find ways to build the trust. Uh, we're looking at a lot of commercial-based products. People talk about, well, Defense Department, Department of Homeland Security, you should have warehouses full of radios where you go down to some place and provide them with radios to communicate. Well, first of all, it's not necessarily a good idea because now we've got warehouses full of radios that are degrading at the rate of Moore's Law. Second of all, the thing we've learned in these operations is you do best to fall in on the capabilities that the local folks have already. The last thing you want to do in the midst of a crisis where everything is discombobulated is come in and say, ah, throw away the way you were doing things before, pick some new thing that we're going to impose on you, uh, and now you've got not only the training issues but all the additional social issues. So we want to find ways to bridge to the communications, networks, whatever, of the indigenous users as much as possible. So one of the things that's been looked at for communications are lease packages. We you know, sign deals with a series of providers say we need three spot beams, uh, two megs up, four megs down, anywhere in the United States within 12 hours, and 12 beams within 72 hours, something like that. So that kind of approach is one of the things being looked at. I mentioned unclassed geospatial products. When you talk to the non-governmental organizations, the thing you hear more than anything else that they need is road information. Where are the bridges out? Where, how can I get the goods to the villages? And we often have that. We've got terrific pictures from all sorts of things, from airplanes to stuff barking around on orbit. And how do you declassify that and produce it in a form that you can just give to somebody who may, you know, may be from a potentially hostile or, or at least unfriendly country, but who's trying to help the people uh, in, the, um, in the immediate need? Mention the social networks and the subject matter, matter experts. You go to the uh, tsunami, how do I find quickly a, neuro, uh, a neuroscientist who speaks Bahasa Indonesia and scuba dives. And we're starting to build the networks to be able to do that. At the same time, that person's not going to be too useful in the lower ninth ward of uh, New Orleans. So in that situation, how do you put together a different kind of social network? We have to have those sorts of folks identified beforehand and available to reach out. So the operational concept here is basically what's unusual for DOD is this is essentially an intranet uh, extra net problem for us. And we haven't been used to dealing in that very much. Uh, within DOD, we have a series of intranets, and some handle classified, some handle unclassified, some handle uh, intelligence information. But we're working out here mainly in the DMZ with some sort of a portal that provides a common shared workspace. And the way this is being deployed, and it's, it's no big deal as far as a lot of people work, but it is a big deal for setting this up for the government. It's in the .org domain rather than .mil. There are a number of uh, non-governmental organizations whose charters preclude them from dealing with the drooling fang militarists. Okay. But 
as we said, they need some of our geospatial information. We certainly need their local knowledge. We need their understanding of how to distribute food. So how do we work together? So by working this in the, in the .org domain and setting up, you know, again, the sort of tools that the rest of the world has been dealing with it for a long time and we're just beginning to employ blogs, wikis, uh, uh, photo notes, annotated photography, uh, find a way to share. So we're also trying not to establish this as a monopoly. Some of those little people down there in the, in the middle between the two, uh, two vertical lines are additional combatant commanders. We have five regional combatant commanders around the world, the Pacific Command, the Central Command, the European Command, so on and so forth. Each one of them is doing something for their own local area. And rather than scrapping it and forcing something down their throat, we're trying to set up here a, you know, a, a space where all the good ideas can be mashed together. Uh, next. So phase one of this is up and running. We rolled this out about a month ago. And as you can see, it contains just pretty uh, straightforward capabilities. By single domain chat, I mean it can, it can only stay in unclassed space. It doesn't yet go to classified networks. Um, phase two, the VMOC is the Virtual um, uh, Military Operations Center. Uh, and uh, that's a set of tools being developed just to bring in better visualization capabilities. RIGEN is something that was developed. It's a regional information joint awareness network. It can be developed for homeland security, uh, being used to in some of the ports around the U.S. We think we'll have a secure chat that will let us go from unclassified up to uh, our classified networks. And really, really, really importantly, and this is where I invite your inputs as much as possible, we need to find a way to inject entrepreneurial concepts into this. I mean, defense ultimately needs to uh, have a stable program of record that gets transitioned from year to year to year and funded and so on and so forth. And that's great. But given the pace of change in the environment, given the you know, great ideas and the vulnerabilities that are being discovered, we have to find a way to inject those ideas into the system in days to weeks rather than 17-year cycles. Next. One of the interesting concepts that's come up is some called hastily formed networks. Because thus far I've been dealing mainly with the, the collaboration tools, information sharing. But very often in these situations, you don't have the communications link. There is no network. You can't be interoperable if you can't operate in the first place. And so how do you set up the hastily formed network in a crisis uh, that can then be dismantled when the job is done? Um, the definition that's working now in the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey has actually done some really pioneering work on this, uh, is essentially a combination of physical, social, and information networks, not just comms. But a lot of it is built around uh, 802.11, 802.16 nets, of which we've heard so much uh, you know, interesting stuff today. Uh, we've just had the USNS Mercy. It's a hospital ship that's been out in the Philippines. And they'll pull into a port in the southern Philippines. And the doctors will go ashore and work with the hospitals. And they're doing terrific work. But because there may be power only three hours a day in the port, there's no way for the doctors to communicate back to the ship with a local communication system saying, I need this, or do telemedicine with some university that wants to work together. So we've developed these deployable packages of rapidly deployable comms that can be brought in, set up in you know, a few hours, uh, and handle the underlying network uh, on which the information is going to be shared. Um, what we need to learn, a lot of skills about the interagency and coalition operations, what, what happens at the civil military boundary. Over the past couple of years, we've run a series of demonstrations. And the first was in 2000, and it was on, you know, many of you remember the Rwanda-Burundi crisis of uh, 94, 95. Uh, and uh, this was a replication of that. Uh, it was a major refugee flows in the face of disasters. And the idea was to how do you get military medicine to talk to the civil medicine community. And so the lingua franca of this was, was English. But as it turned out, not really. Because one person would say food, and somebody would think 50-pound bags of rice, and somebody else would think meals ready to eat, and somebody else would think something else. 
And so just getting the, the, the sharing of information and the common, uh, you know, how to grok what was going on led to some very, very interesting uh, new displays and collaboration tools. For example, one of the most interesting displays was the situation in refugee camp came to be displayed in toroids. Uh, and you say, well, why a toroid? Okay, a toroid is a mathematical donut. And so you say, here's the size of the refugee camp on the map. And the size of the toroid is the uh, size of the refugee camp. And the thickness is the number of people in the camp. And the status is red, yellow, green. So, okay. But the trend that can be shown in surface roughness of the donut, if it's shiny, things are getting better. If it's really rough, then things are getting worse. Uh, the quality of the data can be shown by the transparency. If it's good data, uh, then you got an opaque donut. If it's not, then it'd be quasi-transparent. And then you can have the power of toroid and the s uh, sanitation subtoroid and the food subtoroid. Just walk in the room, you see right away that we're red or yellow going to red because there are not enough sanitation to handle the number of people are going to be there in the next 48 hours. So some innovative displays like this have come out of this kind of thing. Uh, capacity to improvise. One of the things about the U.S. Armed Forces that's probably the greatest single strength of the Department of Defense is the innovation and um, skill sets of our junior officers and enlisted. Uh, the, and one of the things we have to be very careful about with the network is that we don't do anything to destroy that. A couple years ago, I was out uh, looking at a new Marine Corps command and control vehicle. And this thing had taken an old vehicle, had four radios in it, and they chucked them out and they put in three computer displays. And they had all kinds, they had 12 radios and satellite dishes and all sorts of displays. And you could see the tactical picture on maps. And, and I went back to a re Marine General friend of mine and said, wow, you should see what I've seen. And this comment was, Lynn, this terrifies me. Because it now gives the senior leadership the ability to destroy the greatest asset of our armed forces, which is the innovation and, and um, independence, if you will, of our officer and enlisted. I thought about that, and you know, it, there certainly is that possibility. But the Navy has actually been through this a lot over several years. We've put in data links, and it's an issue of training. You've just got to train people to say, you can't go in and micromanage anything, everything, General. You've got to back off and let people uh, operate at their own level. But it's not something that comes naturally. It's, again, part of this cultural thing and what leadership in the network really means. And then finally, we have to overcome the tendency to say, OK, I'm going to centralize everything at the command headquarters and get it out to the edge. Next. Um, so what are we doing way ahead? We've got uh, solutions to for road roadblocks exist both in policy and authorities. I've spent a good part of the last month with the Senate Armed Services Committee who's writing the authorization bill. And it turns out that there is a law that talks about humanitarian assistance and disaster relief from the U.S. military. And it says that you can do rudimentary construction and repair. Okay? Well, it turns out that half the lawyers look at rudimentary and say that cannot include any information and communications technology. So as a result, right now in the Dominican Republic, we're building some hospitals, and the troops feel they are forbidden by policy, by law, from putting phone lines or internet connection in the hospital, because somehow it's prohibited in the law. Uh, you can build a wall, you can build windows, you can build a well, you can build a road. Somehow you can't connect it to anything. So we're working with the Congress to get the law at least clarified that says, look, basic and rudimentary in these days includes the ability to connect to the services that the people are really going to need. Uh, there are all these combatant commanders I mentioned. Uh, these folks are out there working already, and we need to find a way to leverage what they're doing. Again, the operations are not major combat operations, but they are humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, stability, security, transition, reconstruction, and building partner capacity. Another huge change in this area came last November when the Secretary signed out a document that basically said that these SSTR, Stabilization Operations, will be accorded the same priority in the Department as major combat operations. That is just enormous change. And again, it opens the door for all the things we're talking about here. We've got to find a way to get the right tools, migrate into the global information grid, and then ev evolve this version 1.0. The vision of this, uh, this version, right now we're in 1.0. Every year, June 1st, defines the hurricane season in the United States. 
So we're looking at version two will roll out next May, version three, May after that, version four. So every year we're spiraling this based on lessons learned uh, about around the U.S. hurricane season. At the same time, we want to take this entrepreneurial injection we talked about earlier and a series of experiments so that in roughly four-month cycles we can upgrade. So that's sort of what we're sh shooting for. Version 1.1 in October, version 1.2 in February, version 2.0 next May. And again, we you know, really welcome ideas from the floor. Um, tactic techniques and procedures. This is really important for the military. There's a certain amount of structure that has to go into this. And even as I talk about the entrepreneurial spirit of the junior officers enlisted, it really helps if you have the checklist that says, okay, it's all right to provide communication technologies to the hospital before you go in. To have decided ahead of time that says that the operations officer of the Joint Task Force that's running this thing is empowered to release photographs of the roads to Doctors Without Borders. You know, it just helps to have that, and that's what the tactic techniques procedures is. And finally, uh, work the overall network architectures. Next. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. But the real point is that this represents a social, cultural, and technological change for the department that just reinforces the importance to us of working with the folks here uh, in this audience. We're going to have a demonstration later this month uh, of these. And the situation is going to be uh, a combination of a pandemic plus a terrorist incident has completely destroyed the social networks of a community. So the power grid doesn't work, the transportation doesn't work, the communications don't work. In that environment, how do you rebuild the networks? How do you reestablish the connectivity? And particularly, how do you reestablish citizens' trust and the ability of government to deliver, deliver government services without having the whole thing degrade into chaos and uh, vigilanteism and whatever? So this is the stakes that this is all playing for. I'd also just like to reiterate in this context the point I made last night, those of you who heard the Meet the Fed. In the next five years, approximately, roughly 40% of the acquisition workforce in the Department of Defense and that 40% is 60,000 people are going to be eligible for retirement. That's going to create enormous opportunities for the folks with your skill sets, with your uh, interests, uh, with your motivations to come and work with us on some things that maybe you hadn't thought about, like these types of operations. They're not uh, you know, a lot of what you think the DOD typically does. And so if you're interested, if you, uh, if you are qualified, if you have the capabilities, I'd very much uh, be interested in talking with you afterwards. So let me stop there and open it to questions. Please. Uh, why don't we go to the mic, if you would, please. Uh, my question concerns the IOS and the, the folks that do OPSEC. Are they maybe a bit concerned that say methods or intentions or capabilities are going to be inadvertently really, uh, released, the pieces of the puzzle could be fitted together in doing these humanitarian actions? The answer is absolutely. There are people who are terrified about this. And frankly, we don't know how to do this very well. Um, the, I mentioned the, in, the insurgency in, in, in Aceh province in Indonesia. Uh, there have been other cases uh, where you know, two of our own states maybe don't want to uh, totally share information on, on the other side, each side of the state boundary with what's going on. Uh, so we have concerns about revealing information about military tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, about our capabilities. For example, uh, one of the problems with reveal, releasing imagery from overhead satellites is uh, everybody agrees that it's needed, but can you release it at other than, say, for official use only? Well, for official use only for a non-governmental organization, it might as well be secret code word. Uh, so in the last month, uh, we've gotten the release of 162 gigabytes of imagery of Afghanistan totally free and clear to share with anybody. Again, there's just been enormous progress really over the last 12 months since the definition of stabilization and reconstruction was, was deemed to be this important. Um, we're trying to figure out some algorithm that says, okay, any unmanned air vehicle smaller than a Predator, say, the video from that will be assumed to be declassified. And, uh, and, and the Joint Forces Command down at Norfolk 
has a cell that's devoted to lessons learned. They try to take anything we do and figure out what we could have done better. Or what. So hopefully out of these, by monitoring what's going on, we'll, we'll make some mistakes. We won't wind up with fundamental long-term compromises in the security. Please. If the, if the way ahead is to uh, share information with uh, NGOs and uh, other nations, unclassified information, possibly classified in the future as well, um, wh what is DOD doing right now to satisfy uh, information sharing um, with currently, um, especially in the areas of computer network defense? Uh, areas of what? Yeah, computer network defense, yeah. specifically. So the question is, uh, if, if the future is sharing all this uh, with NGOs and people like that, what are we doing now to share information, especially in areas like computer network uh, defense? And uh, so, and you're talking about with the private sector, uh, primarily. Private sector, um, but internally as well. Okay. Uh, across so services, co-coms. Got um, it. All right. So both internally and externally. The uh, let me answer in several different ways. Uh, in the wake of the publication of the 9/11 Commission report. There was a, a, a presidential directive went out to mandate a dramatically improved information sharing environment across the U.S. government for counterterrorist purposes. And there actually is set up an information sharing executive who's in charge of making sure that the stove pipes are broken down and the information gets shared. Uh, the, there's actually an awful lot happening in that area. And in fact, some folks are saying what's happening is we're getting too much information shared right now because anybody is afraid to have something sitting on their laptop when the, if something else happens, they just throw it over the, the transom into the, uh, into the counter-terrorist executive. But what's happened is a realization that this same information sharing needs to be expanded. So for example, we have, uh, in addition to um, uh, counter-terrorism, we've got avian flu. There's a whole batch of different class of information that needs to be shared there. There's a whole, uh, uh, the air traffic control system in the United States is about to migrate to, from a radar-based to a data-based, GPS-based uh, system. That information needs to be shared. And so the underlying principle in everything we're doing is, um, is a data strategy that says all data have to have metadata tags on them to make them discoverable, accessible, and understandable. And we in the intelligence community uh, share the same metadata tagging scheme as we do with NATO, and we're working to extend this now to the Department of Homeland Security, which you know, get, goes a long way to be able to get these user-defined pictures we're talking about. In addition, on the network defense, uh, about 18 months ago, an organization was stood up called the uh, Joint Task Force for Global Network Operations. And the U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha was given responsibility for the operations and defense of all DOD networks. <coughs> that had never existed before. And so uh, as we try to work through the concept of operations for all this, there at least now is one belly button you can go to to put all the information, sharing information, uh, uh, information together. The problem has been that a lot of this, uh, they're, they're cultural barriers, and so it's still not operating as well as you should. The second piece is back in the Clinton administration, there was something called uh, Presidential Decision Directive 63, which dealt with critical infrastructure. And set up in this were a series of things called information sharing and analysis centers, where the private sector was supposed to meet the government, and so the financial sector could say, well, we're seeing attacks on, the, uh, on here, and uh, what, do you, what intelligence do you have about this? It turns out of the, I think there are nine sectors, a couple are working really well, a lot of them are not working well, and uh, we've never have gotten the trust built up in some of the private sectors to allow us to, to share as well. So I think actually in the information technology arena, among the large companies, among the, 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 the um, Microsofts and the Bell Souths and the, uh, and the Lucents and that, there's a pretty good sharing of both intelligence and information and, and, and threat information. The concern I have is that the entrepreneurial venues out there, the people really doing a lot of the cutting edge work, are not part of that. And I'd like to find a way to extend it, uh, extend it further. So I think we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a way to go. Uh, could you go to the mic, could you, please? Recognizing the challenges that exist technologically, uh, you mentioned both from a net-centric perspective as well as from the enterprise perspective. Uh, 
what is going to be happening to take care of the non-technical issues, specifically the cultural differences between the services, as well as the historical lack of good coordination w with NGOs and others. Because you mentioned the, the general being afraid of those net-centric technologies for reasons which have been brought up in the past. What are we doing to fix that moving forward? Well, one of the, one of the first places it started is an emphasis from the top that this change is really important. And if you look through the Quadrennial Defense Review, which is this four-year review that's just been finished, and the strategic planning guidance that came out of it, the critical importance of net centricity and the need to share is just riddled throughout the document. So no one can be in the least bit uh, uh, in any doubt that the senior leadership of the department is committed to this approach. Uh, second, I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a human constant, human time lag somewhere of just, just getting, internalizing the new procedures. So uh, this has been out for about eight months now. We're starting to see some progress. Um, we actually see it a lot down at the lower level, say the junior officers and the enlisted. We see it quite a lot of the senior generals. The problem is actually in the middle levels of the bureaucracy where the word hasn't quite gotten through yet. So that's kind of what we're focused on. But I was astonished, <laughs> frankly, about uh, a year ago to have been in a meeting with a four-star general and an undersecretary of defense and hear the two of them discussing the merits of different approaches to metadata tagging. <laughs> you know, a year and a half ago, they probably wouldn't even understood what the term was. So, so it, it's working. Uh, and uh, it just is going to take time. Thanks. Uh, let me take this from here, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the... Um, the players you described. Of course, just grab the mic. Sure. All right. About the players you described in this uh, architecture um, are large organizations, uh, whether public, private, uh, government, foreign, or domestic. Domestic. What about the individual citizenry and uh, other groups formed out of the citizenry, like uh, for domestic issues, uh, amateur radio operators, ham operators? Do you take into account both their ability to consume information and act on it, but also perhaps their capability, in the case of the ham operators, to provide critical in infrastructure? I mean, they've been there for years. I I'm really glad you asked this. The question, if you didn't hear, was what about uh, individual citizens, ham radios operators, private groups, not organized entities? Um, the, there's a group called the National Institute for Urban Search and Rescue, which is doing a lot of work on preparations for all hazards disasters, uh, terrorism, earthquakes, fire, flood. And one of the points that they make is that this, the citizen, the, the individual is the best first responder. If you have a fire in your kitchen and you can put it out with your little kitty fire extinguisher, you're way ahead of the game. You have to wait for the fire department to come and put down the half of your house that hasn't already burned yet. Um, and so a lot of emphasis is going into what can we do to get individual citizens you know, ready for 72 hours worth of disaster, say? I mean, if all of us had in our, uh, in our, went to our state disaster uh, preparedness uh, organization website and we're really ready for what's on the, on the stages there, we'd be vastly better off. And this has been a re recurrent message that's part of this. Uh, during the DARPA Grand Challenge, which was the robot race out in you know, uh, one of the people in, who has been working on these issues for us um, was responsible for route surveillance. Uh, and so in case there had been an accident, the rescue helicopters could come land and not hit a power line or crush a desert toward us or, you know, whatever. You know. So it turned out they went into a uh, community college and in a bare wall classroom within three hours had a command center up and running that covered the entire length of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the route, done almost entirely by ham radio operators and uh, VSAT, uh, VSAT terminals. Uh, and the ham is becoming actually back into military use. The Mars program kind of uh, faded out for a while. So in this, uh, it's, it's really being used a lot more. Uh, and uh, at least in, in the demonstration we're talking about here at the end of August, we plan to make, uh, make use of ham radio as well, even including, I mean, networking over HF, I mean, packets over HF and things like that. So, good question. Please. 
Well, as your workforce uh, does require, uh, I'm sorry, retires and you're bringing in lots of new younger people, how are you adjusting the internal culture and just the workplace environment to adjust for the expectations of a younger workforce? Like, uh, and especially if you want creative people, it's very hard, like creative people don't like to work behind walls, you know, or behind guards. And just, just the whole federal environment is, it kind of ruins your creativity after a while. I, I, a little bit jaded, so. Are you this is such a great question, because in fact, we've had this discussion a lot. And the point about you know, Gen X and Gen Y and you know, the extent to which being connected is not just a nice to have feature, but an inherent part of the lifestyle. And then you say, welcome to the federal government and you're <laughs> gonna work in a secure classified information facility, check your Blackberry, your phone, your every uh, portable device at the door. And getting senior managers to understand that this is not just an irritant, this may in fact be a total demotivator. Uh, at the same time, you, as we've heard, you know, the wireless explosion introduces security vulnerabilities that are non-trivial. And I don't think any of us, I certainly don't, except to be aware of the problem, understand what the balance is going to work out. I mean, there's a related issue here, and it has to do with the management of outsourced services. We're doing really well. We, we know how to acquire ships, tanks, and planes and tangible thingies. <laughs> but right now, more than, uh, there's more money spent on contractor salaries and contracted services than on the salary of government employees today in the federal government. And this is only going to uh, expand. And so while we know how to buy things, almost none of us knows how to manage outsourced services. And that's going to be another set of skills going to have to be you know, either brought into or taught to this revised workforce. So I would love to hear more about ideas on how to do this, short of saying, oh, screw the security, it's, it's not a problem. But there's got to be some sort of balance in this need to share information sharing mobile wireless environment and the culture of the people who are coming into it. So thank you for raising it. I wish I had an easy answer, but it is being, it is really being discussed at senior levels. Yes. Um. Dr. Wells, when you're discussing the information here and saying what the DOD is doing, preparing for problems both domestically and internationally, uh, doesn't a domestic problem fall under the realm of FEMA, or is the DOD also performing hand-in-hand -hand with FEMA at this point, or are they going to be taking over the operations from FEMA? We're absolutely not going to be taking over. I mean, FEMA, it, it is in the realm, actually, of Department of Homeland Security, not, not FEMA. Uh, and the question is, I mean, the federal, there is something called a federal response plan. Mm -hmm. And the federal response plan basically says it's up to the local authorities. If they can't do it, they turn to the state. If the state can't do it, they turn to the federal government. If the federal government can't handle it within FEMA or DHS, then they call on DOD to provide those value-added services that aren't elsewhere available. And we certainly saw in Katrina and Rita where some of those were called on. But the, uh, the, the lead for that remained with the Department of Homeland Security. So there are some questions. If you had a truly catastrophic a nuclear terrorist incident, would some kind of changes be made? That's actually being discussed at very high political levels, and I can't comment on it. But the, the, the federal response plan assumes that DHS will be in charge, DOD in support. Oh, it is. But, but when you say FEMA, it's actually FEMA within the context of Homeland Security. You're absolutely right. I think I have time for one more. Yes, Dr. Wells, thank you. Uh, I'm hearing packets over HF pro products. I'm hearing that the industry is, uh, do we have a significant cost of paying contractor salaries? Uh, COTS and GOS software is uh, now more expensive than ever. What is the department's position on trying to do some kind of open source project where they manage it federally but open it up as somewhat of an open source project for developing some of these solutions? So three years, three, three weeks ago, I kicked in several hundred thousand, several hundred thousand dollars into a, a quad-sponsored effort called the Open Technology Development Initiative that's expressly trying to get to open source, or actually open standards, and uh, you know, open source raises all sorts of flags in the, in the government community, but open standards and perhaps open source to get beyond, get to exactly some of the issues you're trying to raise. So we have a, um, I think it's a nine-month nine spiral to see what can be turned in, uh, and we're really going to try to make use of that to find a new way of doing business. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the chance to talk with you today.